Good morning and welcome to the Ricky Matthews Show from the Citizens Bank Studio. I hope you're having a great day as we continue to celebrate so many people across the state of Mississippi who are working so hard in the trenches to make this such a great place to live, work, and play. If you, look at, if you just look back over the past week, I've had so many thoughtful and important conversations. Like, for example, my conversation with Jonathan Allen from J. Allen Automotive it's, it wasn't a conversation about Jay Allen Automotive. It was really a question, of, a, a discussion about the energy policy in, in America and how it affects, for example, the manufacturing of EV vehicles. And we talked about the rise of uh, hybrids and how much success uh, he's having and others are having with hybrid. But it, you know, it kind of goes, you know, hand in glove with conversations I've had with people from the energy sector specifically, whether it be from Chevron Refinery or from. Uh, barge companies that that um, transport petrochemical uh, uh, agents or, or products in inland waterways of, of America. It's the same thing, that we've got to have a more co- coherent energy strategy. I think most people recognize that electric is in our future, but it, but but you can't force it. You've got to, it has to be a much more thoughtful process because the reality is that that oil is part of our future and electric is part of our future. And, and America's got to be a little bit more realistic about how they approach that. But it was a really, really good conversation. If you missed it, I would really encourage you to go go listen to it. Ron Barnes, you know, I was uh, I was talking offline with our with the guests for today. We'll, we'll be with her in just a second. But um, I was mentioning that Ron Barnes and I had worked in the community together for many years. And I start adding up the number of years. And Ron Barnes, incidentally, in case you missed a conversation, is the CEO of Coast Electric. But we worked in the community in so many different ways. Best I can tell, somewhere between 30 and 40 years. It's, it's hard to, to think back about it, but uh, but it's uh, it's it's been a long time. And Ron is still swinging. And while I got re- while I retired in 2016, you know, the opportunity four years later to get to do this show, you know, I feel like I'm I'm making my contribution to this show. The great opportunity I had to connect with people and tell their stories is it's been a real gift. But it was great to catch up with Ron as we talked to, especially about the the kind of calm hurricane se- season we've had so far and the preparation that is necessary. When I meet with uh, officials from Mississippi Power, we had the same kind of conversations. But uh, but the amount of preparation that's taking place at Coast Electric uh, to you know during the law, <laughs> because clearly this season's going to heat up, you know, and we may be dodging one or two, but that's what I hope we're doing is dodging and not taking a direct hit from something. But it was very very impressive thinking about the work that that Coast Electric is doing under Ron Bar- Barnes's leadership to 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 uh, address. Uh, readiness and making coastal Mississippi more resilient. And the other thing we talked about, and it's something we always want to be focused on, that the bill that was passed by the Mississippi legislature that allowed electric co-ops to get into the um, high-speed internet business through through laying fiber optic uh, cable across the state of Mississippi um, is really important to to, uh, getting you know, the, the ability to connect out to the, the hinderlands of Mississippi, you know, literally deep into the rural areas. And, and who knows the rural areas better than electric co-ops? So really, really good conversation with him. Um, so many others. You can go to Supertalk, uh, 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 Supertalk Gulf Coast Facebook page or to the Ricky Matthews Facebook page or to the Supertalk YouTube page or go to your favorite podcast and just look up the Ricky Matthews show and you can you can listen to any of those shows. And I think you'll be glad you did. I mean, the, the collection of them, over 1,200 conversations over the last four years is, um, is really kind of uh, what I would refer to as maybe a digital history book of coastal Mississippi. Uh, a conversation that uh, that Ron and I had actually during uh, when we talked was about the the great partnership that the Gulf Coast Community Foundation and Coast Electric have. And you know, the Gulf Coast Community Foundation comes up in so many different ways. And I've had the, the real benefit of watching it from day one evolve and become what it is, the role that it played after Hurricane Katrina and the role that it's playing today. I've watched it very closely. And a community is not a community. 
It can't be a full set of communities if it doesn't have a community foundation. And you'll understand a little bit more about why I say that here in just a minute. But I'm thrilled to have Kristen uh, Dewey with me today. She's the executive director for the Gulf Coast Community Foundation, someone I followed her career for a long, long time. <laughs> and I was surprised. She has not been on the show yet. I was I was blown away when I did my research on that. I just knew she had been. But anyway, you know, there's always a first. Kristen, how you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Like you said, we're righting a wrong today. <laughs> we, should, we, we, should, we should have done this a long, long time ago. Hey, listen, um, we've got a really important, the second annual One Coast Jam coming up. And we'll talk about that. It's coming up on Tuesday, August the 27th. We'll, we'll, mm-hmm. we'll, we'll circle back to that. But we have a, we have a whole uh, show together today. I thought maybe a good place to start for people who don't know anything about the Gulf Coast Community Foundation. You could kind of give your yellow elevator speech. We're gonna we, then we're gonna spend a little bit of time on your path to this position, and then we'll come back to the Gulf Coast Community Foundation and really start to talk about not only this upcoming event but specifically the role that you're playing in so many different ways to help fill gaps in this community. So that's kind of where we're going. So what what's your elevator speech when you're talking to somebody? Uh, well, you know, a community foundation is one of those things that a lot of people I think are very confused about who we are and what we do. And essentially what we do is we help people help people. And we do that through the creation of different funds. We have over 100 different funds here. And those were created by individuals, companies, um, different nonprofit groups. To And they all identify different needs in the community, charitable needs. And through them, we help people um, on a variety of things. We have uh, funds that support animal welfare, child welfare, um, scholarship funds. Um, as you mentioned, we have the fund with Coast Electric. We've had a great partnership with them, and Ron Barnes is actually one of our board members. And we've given over a million dollars away through their Operation Roundup a fund that's held here. And so, really, we just work within the community. We represent the lower six counties. We've been here for 35 years this year. And so, our goal and mission is to make the Mississippi Gulf Coast a better place. And we do that through helping others uh, through lots of collaboration. Yeah, it's, uh, it's always been, it's really important. If you think about this, think of it as a, almost like a bank for the community. And, yes. But it plays more, of, more, more the, of a role than a bank would play because on one end, it may actually, in the case of the, uh, the Roundup program with Coast Electric, you're actually helping to administer that, mm-hmm. helping to sort of roll it out and get the money out to various different organizations. So there's these big funds like that. It could be, a, my, my wife Ann and I, for example, we could set aside $1,000 a year that we want to go to a scholarship program. And we're not going to set up a 5013C, a nonprofit, yeah. to be able to do that. But under the under sort of the, the umbrella of the Gulf Coast Community Foundation, we can, we that 5013C to sort of act as a mechanism for us to do what would be referred to as a donor advised fund. We were, Ann and I would advise the, the fund mm-hmm. to be to the $1,000 to go to a, to a, to a particular uh, scholarship and the foundation would help, uh, help administer that. Uh, and all points in between, it really, it, it just, you're constantly changing and adapting and innovating. Um, that's what the community foundation does, isn't it? It is. And, uh, what you just said, I've heard a different funds called a charitable savings account is a good way to look at it. So if you know that you want to give away a certain amount a year, if you wanted to start an endowment because down the road you'd like to do something, uh, we help people do that every day. And really, um, as you said, a donor advised fund is where you can choose basically where you want your money to go. There are different ways to give into that. And of uh, we have a great board of directors that also oversees all of the grants that go out from uh, the community foundation. So, yeah, we're very we try to stay very much in tune to what's happening around us. We and I think one of the things that people are confused about with the community foundation is people just assume we have all this money, and we do, but it's not really our money to give away. It's some of it is donor advised funds, which is kind of up to them to do or a scholarship that's meant for a very specific thing or it's the Wilson Animal Fund that can only be used for animal welfare. But we do have a couple that we do help oversee, and I know you're familiar with the Knight Foundation. Uh, We have a fund with them and have for many, many years. 
And so every year they put around $100,000 into the community um, in Gulfport or Biloxi. And um, so last year they supported the How Hot project with Biloxi Main Street. And um, they also gave to, we're working with a group of people to have a permanent memorial for the Biloxi wait-ins. And so we're working with the city of Biloxi on that right now. Um, and the Knight Foundation supported that project this last year. Yeah, I've had uh, had many conversations over the course of the past four years about the Knight Foundation. I was thrilled to be the chairman of the Local Citizens Advisory Committee for a number of years. Mm-hmm. Publishers who are in Knight communities from, from uh, newspapers in Knight communities served that role. And I had tremendous opportunities to to, to uh, contribute in that way. And of course, Hurricane Katrina being the most significant. And my really personal, very dear friendship with uh, Alberto Ibargo, the former mm-hmm. chairman of the yes. Knight Foundation, yes. came in to, to bear big time after Hurricane Katrina. But man, what, a, what an incredible organization. Hey, when we come back on the other side, we'll continue our conversation with Kristen Dewey. We'll see you after this. Welcome back to the Ricky Matthews Show from the Citizens Bank Studio. We're having a conversation with Kristen Dewey, who is the executive director of the Gulf Coast Community Foundation. This is a real opportunity for you, if you don't know much about the Gulf Coast Community Foundation, to, to, to take it all in and understand that you ha- I really mean it when I say you don't have a complete community if you don't have a community foundation. Um, you know, Roland, Roland Weeks, when we when the Community Foundation was started, I, I never will forget the, the lessons that he taught me about how important this was. But we didn't have a place for this money to go. We didn't have we were we didn't understand what we were missing. That's that's important. Mm-hmm. And then you go you fast forward many years later when Hurricane Katrina hit and you understood all this mountain of money that came in, you know, truthfully, we would have had a difficult time attracting some of that money if we didn't have a community foundation for it to land because people trust community foundation. That's really important, isn't it? Yes, very much so. <laughs> we rely a lot on our trust with our with our donors because it's other people's money that we have. So everything we do, we want to make sure that we're using it the exact way, especially if someone is now deceased and they set up a fund before they passed away or there's still a family that's involved with it. And so we, that's our big thing is we ensure that whatever it is that you'd like to support from now until the end of time, you know, that's what your money will be used for. And we have, we've done that for 35 years. Well, listen, uh, Ann and I have, uh, obviously, um, we're of age that you got to do a good estate planning, and we have for mm-hmm. we have for 15 or 20 years. And, you know, as time goes on, you, you want to make adjustments. You know, it's like, for, mm-hmm. for example, when we are dead and gone, we'll have a, a big chunk of our money going to a university. And we, more recently, we thought, well, we, we definitely want to do some endowment at a university. But but maybe there's something we want to do locally, too. So mm-hmm. in that case, if we were to make an adjustment, the the perfect partner to bring into that conversation would be the Gulf Coast Community Foundation to say, you know, it's just, it's just planning. They're going to be part of this. You know, when, God forbid something were to happen, there would be through through our state would be a place for some contribution to be set up in and in my name. And it would be distributed in however we want it to be distributed. You deal with many, many, many scenarios mm-hmm. like that, don't you? Yes, we do. And one of that's one of the first questions we ask when we meet with people that are interested in just learning more about the foundation or how to set up a fund is we ask, well, what are you passionate about? Um, what is it that you want to see done? And some people have money and they just don't know what they want to support. They just know that once they're gone, that they don't want their money to just sit idle somewhere. They want it to go to good. So they'll ask us, what are the most pressing needs right now in our community? And obviously, I mean, children, education, all of those things are the, are at the top of that list. So, yeah, we really work hard to work with individuals to let them know what their opportunities are and how we can better serve their needs. So if you have a scenario like what I just talked about, uh, reach out to Kristen and talk to her about it. She can help guide you. The more yeah, these kind <laughs> Say it again? We'd love to talk to you. Anybody. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so there we can't have enough of these. And this mm-hmm. is just another way I talk on this on this show all the time about, you know, you've got United Way and and uh, the Red Cross and uh, the Heart Association and the Chambers and the Gulf Coast Business, all these organizations fill needs in certain ways. And But the reality is there's always going to be things that are falling through the cracks, lots of things, thousands of things. And and people like us who have the opportunity to 
to endow have the opportunity to help fill those gaps. And if you want to have a conversation about how to best go about that, Kristen would be a really good one to talk to. I really encourage you to do it. That's This is why we have a community foundation. Yeah. So let's take a step back. Oh, were you going to say something, Kristen? I didn't want to oh, interrupt Well, you. I was going to say, too, you mentioned other nonprofits. And one of the other things I just want people to understand is we are not in a competition with any other nonprofit here. We actually give out a lot of money to our local nonprofits. And several nonprofits have funds here with us. With, they have their own endowments so that they'll have extra income coming in every year. And you can still give to, say, United Way through the Community Foundation. So there are ways to still support if you wanted to set up an endowment, if there are three organizations or four organizations that you want to make sure get your support forever, we can set up a fund for that. And then through the endowment, through the earnings, we make sure that those organizations get the money that you want to set aside for that. So there's always a way to give to whatever you want to support. Chris and I was in reading about you. It was great to see that in 2013, you were, you were recognized as a top 10 under 40 for, by the Sun Herald program, which is now the one coast awards, which, um, you know, that's, that's been really important. What we, what we did, I felt very strongly when we started these awards that we needed to hold people like you up as an example for other people to follow. And you go, you, if since then you've, you've, You've won, I say one, you've been recognized in so many different ways as a result of your leadership. But people can tell you're a great communicator, but, but, and you are a very good communicator. But well, thank you. You really, um, you really did your time in, in public relations training and, and significant work holding major uh, leadership roles in public relations organizations. Um, you didn't. You didn't take lightly the need to prepare yourself to be, for example, the executive director for the Gulf Coast Community Foundation. Where did that come from? Where did this drive to want to be the best version of yourself come from? Um, I honestly don't know. <laughs> I just from a young age, you know, growing up, um, we didn't have a lot, and so I always just said you will do better than your circumstances. And so I just I knew I was going to go to college. I was lucky enough to work with Kimberly Nastasi at the Coast Chamber. And through that, actually, is when I met you for the first time. We had a meeting with you to talk about uh, starting the Coast Chamber Professionals event that where they honor mentors, because we knew that you, the Sun Herald, had your awards, and we wanted to make sure we weren't, uh, you know, stepping on your toes or doing anything else. So I remember meeting with you. Uh, but I've had the the benefit and the luck to work with some of the most amazing leaders that we've had here. I met Roger Wilder before I worked here, um, just through working at the chamber. He was actually one of the first honorees of the Forever Young Award through the uh, Coach Young Professionals. And working with Kimberly, then working at the community college with Dr. Mary Graham. Um, really, I just have been very, very fortunate. And even now in this role, uh, community foundations are a totally different animal. And so I think I've just been very blessed to have amazing mentors. Uh, we mentioned Ron Barnes again, he's been, he was one of my, you know, big public relations mentors for a very, very long time. And so it was even more special to start in this role where he would be on the board. But I think I've just always wanted to, uh, not necessarily be successful, but I just wanted to make sure that I was always putting my best foot forward and, you know, I never thought I'd go and get a master's degree. And then after working at the chamber with Kimberly, that's something she pushed me to do. And then um, working at the college, something Dr. Graham pushed me to do was to get my doctorate. And so I never, you know, if I could go back to the high school version of me and say, one day you'll have a doctorate in higher education, I'd say you were crazy. Uh, but I think I've just always been open to, to new challenges and things like that. And I think COVID taught us about just being very versatile and knowing that things are going to change and you just have to go with the flow. And I just, and I love people. I love our community and, you know, I wouldn't be who I am if it weren't for our, for our community. So I want to make sure that I'm being that for other people. And so I just uh, have been very, very fortunate to have people around me that have always pushed me up and have believed in me. Hey, you'll, you'll get a kick out of this. Um, often we so say when you're a publisher, when you're a publisher of a newspaper, people think, you know, a lot, they think, you know, everything, <laughs> let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. And what, what I've, the way I describe it is that the more we learn, the more we better learn how much we don't know. And mm -hmm. I, I would say being a publisher is 
a very humbling experience. And it makes it gives you a thirst for wanting to learn more. Now, look, I was always kind of a human sponge. You, you go back and talk to any of my teachers early in my life. I was always a human sponge. I wanted mm -hmm. to I wanted to take in and experience as much as I possibly. I was always going to be the guy in a corporate scenario that was going to say yes, even to the most difficult challenge, because I knew what I was going to learn, and I especially knew the people that I would be working with. I was going to I was going to learn a lot from them. But but growing older, if you're really true to the journey of self-discovery, you really do understand that we can never know it all. And in fact, the older we get, the more we, we're we learning how much we really don't know. So it keeps you kind of thirsty. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's kind of your story too, isn't it? Yeah. And I think a big part too, I guess, of why I'm here and my success has just been also knowing what I don't know and admitting that and asking for help. Um, because I don't, I certainly don't know everything. And I definitely don't know everything about community foundations, even though it's almost been two years since I've been here, Yeah. but always just having that mindset of you don't know everything. And if you think that you do, you're missing out on a lot of opportunity to be better and to do better for other people. Yeah, I have, uh, I've had the opportunity to chair 5013Cs. I've started two 5013Cs. There's a lot to know from an from an accounting and and legal perspective about how mm -hmm. to do this right. And then when you talk about the complexities of something like the Gulf Coast Community Foundation and how it syncs up with other funds, um, that's why Roger Wilder is an important uh, party to the conversations because yes. his long, you know, legal background is super super important to this conversation. And yes. hey, listen, we're at the end of this segment, but when we come back on the other side, we'll pick it up from right there as we continue our conversation with Kristen Dewey from the Gulf Coast Community Foundation. We'll see you after this. Welcome back to the Ricky Matthews Show from the Citizens Bank Studio, and we're visiting today with Kristen Dewey. He's the executive director for the Gulf Coast Community Foundation, and. Uh, Clear, yes, this is the first time she's been on the show, which is amazing to me. It's we 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 really have fallen down on our duty not to have her here. But maybe this is the first of many conversations because, as you can tell, there's a lot to talk about. And what I want the conversations to be about is is learning things that can make you better, whether it's be better in your job or better in the community. It doesn't matter what age you are. I mean, every, everyone's got more to give. And this show's about teaching you or maybe inspiring you. Let's put, let's put it that way. Uh, inspiring you to want to give more. And because this, you know, that's what makes our community so incredibly resilient. And those of us who were in the throes of battle after Hurricane Katrina, man, we understood, we, we came to understand why that is important how impo and how compelling that, that overall uh, story is. Speaking of that, I just want to mention one thing. I want to mention something about Kimberly. I, re I remember the show, I remember the meeting with you and Kimberly like it was yesterday. I remember almost every meeting I had with Kimberly, and um, I'll come back to that in a second. I just want to tie that to sort of approach that I was taking. When I was involved in the community, I was always tapping into some significant leaders in the community, and even when I was publisher of the Sun Herald, to try to figure out what can I learn from them. So I had the opportunity to work. First of all, my mentor was Roland Weeks, and he he did a great job of building a foundation. I had the opportunity to work in the trenches with people like George Slogel and Jerry St. Pei. And uh, I, mean, I mean, Anthony Zipazi, former president of, the, of uh, Mississippi uh, Power, who's now passed away, God rest his soul, but he was such a significant leader after Hurricane Katrina. Um you know the the opportunity to, to to work in the trenches with people like John Harrison and uh, Dave Dennis and I mean again I can name lots yeah. of people, but the fact is I learned from all of them. I learned something from every single one of them. I was a human sponge around every single one of them, and it was really important. I saw them even sort of at a as even as a CEO, I saw them as mentors. I saw mm -hmm. them as a, as, a, as people I could learn from, and that was really important to me. I think one of the most important attributes a young leader can have is the ability to identify mentors around you. You you referred to that just a few minutes ago, but I bet that's a lesson you learned from Kimberly to some extent because yeah. you know, let me tell you the relationship Kimberly and I had. Kimberly came to me early in her tenure uh, when she was working for the chamber and said, you know, she would like the opportunity to visit with me more often. And she said, can, can I have a mentoring relationship with you? I said, I would love that. I would love that. And the way it was, the way it worked was my assistant was Karen Shook. And Karen, she didn't, Kimberly didn't even have to call me. She would just call Karen 
and say, you know, can, give me time on Ricky's schedule. And, you know, she would pop up on my schedule and, you know, and it would be Kimberly and I talking. And usually it was, she didn't never, she didn't have an agenda when she would come by and visit. She would sit and we would just talk, you know, she would kind of update me on what's going on. And mm -hmm. it would just be kind of a round robin kind of conversation. Um, the conversation that you and she and I had about Coach Young Professional, it was very much like that. But you can see, I don't know if it's probably hard, you, you know, you're looking back on it, um, what made that conversation go so smoothly, not that it wouldn't have gone smoothly anyway, but was because Kimberly and I already had such a strong established mm -hmm. relationship. She 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 had the wisdom to to know that our paths were going to cross in certain ways beyond a mentoring relationship. And then look at her today at Ingalls and what she's accomplished. I, know. I mean, what a, what an inspiration she has been, hasn't she? Yeah, I mean, and she's still one of my very best friends. And uh, so it's just been really great to see for both of us. And she was my first, you know, boss working in a professional setting. And uh, she still helps me today. I had to call her several months ago when I had an issue here I needed to deal with. And so she's still... That person, as busy as she is, she always makes time for those that need her advice or input, and she's always there to celebrate with you too. So, wow, what a what a what a wonderful leader! And yeah. I, I love this show because I get a chance to reflect on that and mm -hmm. give credit where credit is due. But more importantly, actually, hold her up as an example for others to follow. I mean, that's that's kind of what we're doing here, and now that's mm -hmm. the role you play. And you know the role I can I have more opportunities these days to pay it forward than I ever had when I was publisher, just because of all the connections and conversations that I'm having. So it's really awesome. Um, what, one thing I'd like to say before we get back to the Gulf Coast Community Foundation is that your work at Mississippi Gulf Coast Community College was so important during a time when the college was really strategically focused. Mary Graham and I have had many conversations about that, but. What Gulf Coast Community College has done to create some of the top programs in the state, and when you consider that that the community college system in Mississippi is among the best in the United States, um, you didn't get there haphazardly. You got there because you strategically listened. It was a great learning opportunity for you to be on that team, wasn't it? Oh, absolutely. I think, uh, like I said earlier, I've just been extremely fortunate to work with some of the top leaders on the Mississippi Gulf Coast and being able to work with Dr. Graham and, you know, others at the community college, just their focus, their vision and how dedicated they are to what they do. And also the importance of relationships. I mean, that's something that Dr. Graham has done throughout her career and her tenure as the president of the college and, you know, and still seeing her now. And, you know, one of the funniest things for me was when I started working here, uh, you know, I get to sign all the checks. And so I've been able to sign lots of checks to the community college for different scholarships. And I said, wow, full circle, <laughs> being able to write checks to the college. And uh, but, yeah, I think working there was one of the highlights for sure. And, you know, seeing what they do there, what they continue to do there, it was hard to leave. But. Um, I know that they're in good hands still and just doing really great things and being able to adapt and to grow. Cause I, you mentioned earlier workforce and career technical programs. That is where we need to start looking and encouraging students. You know, not everyone has to go to a four-year university. Um, certainly you can, no one is t telling you not to, but also just keep your mind open. There is money available in some of these other jobs that, you know, people don't think about because I think we're, we're in a society where we just push people to go to a four-year college to be successful. And that's really not true anymore. And I, I think more and more people are seeing that. Hey, I think actually, if you were to take just a hundred students at random, a hundred students that went to the non-traditional approach, which is over 50% at Gulf Coast Community mm -hmm. College. And let's say a hundred students that just, and, and don't, I'm taking them at random. So they could begin in different major majors at any of the universities in Mississippi I guarantee you, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that the students, the 100 students that I picked at random for non-traditional education at Mississippi Gulf Coast Community College are making more money than those who went to traditional university. That's a fact. They've got, you come, I mean, they've got diesel mechanic, very diversified, uh, or, or, or I would say intricate diesel mm -hmm. mechanic training, where you can come out making six figures. I mean, after a two-year yeah. program. Get your head around that. I mean, of course, yeah. I'm telling you what you already know. but Well, and for just two years of training and, you know, in the relationships the college has with local industry, with Ingalls and Chevron and everything in between, 
Um, you know, there is so much opportunity for students if they choose to go that route, because it's not a lot of times, too, when you go get a, you know, I remember when I got my public relations degree and I thought, OK, now what? <laughs> You're kind of on your own and kind of figure out what to do next. But a lot of those jobs through the college, they'll go ahead and place you into a program with one of the local industry leaders, which I think is very, very important and such a great opportunity for those students. Yeah, I mean, some of those programs have have. 100%, if not near 100% placement coming out of them. Uh, yeah. the, 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 the thirst for people with that technical training in the, in the business community is so significant. It's just a, it's, and, and of course, the reputation of Mississippi Gulf Coast Community College mm -hmm. to prepare people for these highly technical jobs is there. So it's really cool stuff. It really is. So, hey, listen, uh, so when you got up this morning, and this, we're coming back to Gulf Coast Community Foundation. <laughs> What do you love most about what you're doing these days? Um, I just, I get to, we get to help people every single day and we have a very small office. There's only five of us. We're actually looking to hire a new position right now in finance, but just the passion of everyone that works in this office. We have someone that's worked here for almost 20 years. There's a few newer folks, but um, you know, the ability to be able to be in a position to not only like be the people who give the money away, but also to be the convener for other groups of people to come together. So through our relationships, Roger's relationships, we're able to get certain people in a room that maybe other people weren't able to do to make some really important things happen. So I think for me, it's just every day is an adventure. We get random phone calls every day from people wanting to meet to talk about the foundation and how we can help them with their charitable and philanthropic needs. And so really, I wake up every day excited to come to work. There isn't a day that I'm like, man, I gotta, I have to wake up and drink some coffee to get ready because we really make a positive difference in our community every single day. And it's just really exciting to do that. And listen, when we were going through the the process of of landing on a on a vision and a plan for the Knight Center, mm -hmm. uh, Alberto arranged for me to go to Princeton to the Robert Woods Johnson Foundation to see their building and their community space, and it was so incredible. And what we've got there and that community resource for something like the Gulf Coast Community Foundation is so important because you can walk out your door and see so many of the people that you need to be talking with. In fact, we'll, we'll pick up there on the other side when we continue our conversation with Kristen Dewey after this break. We'll see you after this. Welcome back to the Ricky Matthews Show from the Citizens Bank Studio. We have Kristen Dewey with us, the Executive Director of the Gulf Coast Community Foundation. And as is usually the case, and I say this often, some of the conversations that take place during the breaks are the ones we probably ought to be recording because we, we talked a little bit about the Knight Foundation's commitment to coastal Mississippi after Hurricane Katrina. That can't be understated. That can't be overstated, excuse me. But, um, hey, listen, we're going we're gonna to share some of the kind of highlights of and headlines of the Co Gulf Coast Community Foundation more recently. But before we go any further, let's talk about the One Coast Jam that's coming up, the second annual, so people yes. can have the facts about that. Yes, yeah, so the One Coast Jam is next Tuesday at 6 p.m. at Ground Zero in Biloxi. And that will support the Better Way to Give Fund, which it's weird to think about. It's been active for a little over a year now. And we met with, uh, speaking of the Night Nonprofit Center, we created a little coalition or advisory committee for the Better Way to Give. We started meeting last year, probably in February, and then put the very first event together in June, really surrounding the panhandling that was happening and still happening around the Mississippi Gulf Coast and little pocket areas, more some more so than others. And, uh, you know, Mayor Hughes reached out to us and asked if we would be interested. And this is something that's been done in other communities. There are signs up uh, that say it's okay to say no to panhandlers. And look, if you want to give to panhandlers, that's you can still do that. We're not saying you can. It's certainly not illegal to panhandle. We're just saying, instead of doing that, consider giving to this fund and through that, we're able to help local law enforcement offers, uh, officers. And we also work with uh, Back Bay Mission and the Open Doors Homeless Coalition to identify individuals that may need our help. Because this fund is really to help individuals that find themselves maybe on the verge of being homeless or newly homeless. We have people, we've bought bus tickets, we've bought, uh, paid for a down payment for an apartment for an individual that had a job, had a car, had an apartment, but couldn't afford you know, the little bit extra that they needed. 
uh, to get the apartment. So we were able to do that. We bought a hotel stays for individuals that um, have found themselves here, maybe trying to get a job or have a job lined up and then can get an apartment. So there are several things that we've been able to do over this last year that's been very exciting for us to be a part of. And also to help the officers, because what was happening prior to this, prior to this fund being created, was they were going into their own pockets sometimes to buy food, to pay, pay for hotel stays, uh, buy tires for people if their car broke down and they couldn't get to where they needed to be. Because we do understand there's a bigger issue with unhoused, unsheltered individuals. Um, and down the road, hopefully, if this fund gets enough money in it, uh, we'd love to play a bigger role with that. But for now, the fund was created to work with law enforcement, first responders, and now uh, Open Doors Homeless Coalition and Back Bay Mission has been a part of this effort from the very, very beginning. And so they're able to work with people, you know, to say, hey, this person has been in the system. This is what has already been done to help them. So we make sure we're not duplicating efforts um, and really identifying the people to not create a bigger issue than we already have. Yeah, when it first uh, launched, uh, I had Billy Hughes and Fofo Gillage join me. Mm -hmm. And it's important. I think it's. I think people feel guilty. And again, you're not saying they can't give. Yeah. But what we're saying is, is a better way to handle this. And mm -hmm. there, there are people who are way too proud to go panhandle and then have very significant needs. And so, you know, why in that moment should you decide? Yeah, this is the person that has has the need. How would you ever know? We, we've, you know, the community has tried to develop an approach that's a little bit more holistic and a little bit more prepared and a little bit more informed. Mm -hmm. And that's what this effort is all about. But on August the 27th at 7 o'clock at Ground Zero Blues Club in Biloxi, what's going to happen? Well, uh, you know, this came, this year it came about because I believe Billy is filming a commercial and they wanted him to perform during the commercial at Ground Zero. And he said, well, if I'm going to be playing, I may as well have another event to support the fund, um, especially since we've opened up now to Open Doors Homeless Coalition and Back Bay Mission, where money is going to be more frequent going out, uh, making sure that we have money in the fund to support that. And so Mayor Hughes will be performing with Mayor Gillich. We had some other local celebrities. I don't have the full lineup, but there will be several local coastal celebrities there performing, um, really just a night of networking and giving back fun. and <clears throat> fun and, and really, really good music. So some really, yeah. <laughs> we got, we've got some talent in coastal Mississippi. We it's really pretty do. cool, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And when you Fofo, can see your mayor on the stage playing the drums, it's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. I, I'm a, I'm a drummer myself and Billy and I sh share notes a lot about that, but Fofo, listen, Fofo, he's got a degree in mathematics, had a very successful software development company <laughs> And you think about taking sort of a mathematics approach to piano. I mean, Fofo's talented. Yes, yes. I remember looking on stage last year, and I think it was one of the last songs that they sang, but it was everybody, the mayors, I think former Governor Phil Bryant was on stage, everybody was singing, and I thought, what what world are we in where this is happening? But it was very, <laughs> very cool to see. Well, listen, we got a lot to talk about the next time we're together, and we'll do it sooner yes. than later so we can really boil down on some of the more you know, some of the big headlines of the Gulf Coast Community Foundation. But for, for what I wanted to accomplish today, I really appreciate it. And I'm sorry it took us so long to, to get together, Kristen. No, I'm glad we have. And I look forward to coming back. You bet. This has been Kristen Dewey, the Executive Director of the Gulf Coast Community Foundation. And hey, listen, have a great day. And we will see you tomorrow.